Welcome. Again, my name is Allison Johnson, Associate Vice President of Content and Program Strategy at NMHC, and I want to welcome you all to another member webinar. Today's policy briefing is a joint presentation with NAA, and we will and will be led by NMHC's Kevin Donnelly, Vice President of Government Affairs, Technology, and Strategic Initiatives, and NAA's Sam Gilboard, Manager of Public Policy. They will be joined by two FEMA representatives, David Marstad, Deputy Associate Administrator for Federal Insurance and Mitigation, and Senior Executive of the National Flood Insurance Program. And Andy Neal will be joining him. He's Actuarial and Catastrophic Modeling Branch Chief for the National Flood Insurance Program. Before we get going, a few administrative notes about this webinar. All attendee lines are muted to ensure, ensure good sound quality. We anticipate this call will last about an hour. The event is being recorded and will be uploaded to the NMHC and NAA websites. There will be opportunities to submit questions to our speakers throughout the course of this broadcast. If you have a question, please use the question box in the control panel on your screen. NMHC staff are monitoring your submissions and we will do our best to address all the questions that come in. And lastly, I want to direct you to our disclaimer. NMHC provides general information to the public and it is not intended to be investment, medical or legal advice. Now, I'd like to turn the broadcast over to Kevin Donnelly. Thank you, Allison. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, as Allison teed up, I'm Kevin Donnelly, VP of Government Affairs Technology and Strategic Initiatives at NMHC. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to, welcome you to, to today's webinar, looking at the impact of FEMA's risk rating 2.0 program on the multifamily rental housing industry. The changes to the National Flood Insurance Program that we'll hear from FEMA about today will have a big impact on the long-term structure and viability of the NFIP in the face of increasing uh, extreme weather events and the worsening effects of climate change on our communities. As you all know, the NFIP is a critical risk mitigation tool for property owners of all kinds, and in our space, ultimately ensures the availability of flood insurance in all markets for all rental property types. It's why the success and long-term solvency of the NFIP is critical for our industry. Before I turn it over to FEMA, I'll ask Sam Gilboard with NAA to join me in welcoming you. Sam? Hey, Kevin, thank you. Uh, yes, don't want to take up too much time. I think we're all looking forward to hearing from uh, David and Andy talk about risk rating 2.0. I uh, just want to reiter reiterate uh, Kevin's points that uh, the coverage offered under the National uh, Flood Insurance Program is uh, an incredibly uh, important tool in mitigating uh, climate-based financial risk for our members in the multifamily industry uh, with risk rating 2.0. Uh, it's an exciting new change uh, coming to the program, and we are all looking forward to learning more about its, its impact uh, on the industry. So um, thank you, Kevin, and thank you, David and Andy, for, uh, for your participation in this event. Um, Kevin, I'll throw it back to you. Thanks, um, Sam. So now let's get to why you're all here. Today, we're lucky, as Allison mentioned, to be joined by two officials from FEMA, uh, David Morstad, FEMA Deputy Associate Administrator for Insurance and Mitigation and Senior Executive of the NFIP. In this role, Mr. Morstad brings unparalleled experience in the emergency management and strategic risk environment from both the public and private sectors to lead the NFIP, which is the world's largest single peril insurance operation, providing over $1.3 trillion in flood coverage to over 5 million US policyholders, many of those rental property owners and commercial property owners across the country. We're also joined by Andy Neal, who serves as the chief actuary of the NFIP and is involved with rate setting and reporting on the NFIP's uh, financial risk to management and stakeholders. And he's uh, notably leading the development of risk rating 2.0. So we're lucky to have both here today. Thank you guys for being here. Um, thank you FEMA for the continued partnership and I'll turn it to David to take it away. All right, <clears throat> good afternoon uh, or uh, good morning, depending upon where you're uh, located. Kevin, thank you for that kind introduction. Certainly good to be with uh, all of you today and I hope you've been uh, staying safe and healthy. Today's engagement with the National Multifamily Housing Council and the National uh, Apartment Association 
is one of thousands of outreach activities and touch points that we've conducted to date over the past several months, including the last time I spoke with uh, NMHC back in April. At that time, we had just announced our intent to launch Risk Rating 2.0 Equity in Action. Fast forward six months. Today, I'm pleased to uh, tell you that on October 1st, the NFIP made history with the implementation of the NFIP's new pricing methodology, one that is actuarially sound, uh, equitable, and designed to adapt to the perils of climate change. After 40 years of operating in, uh, with an outdated system, there is much to appreciate. Under risk rating 2.0, premium rates will decrease, decrease for over 1 million of our policyholders for the first time in the NFIP's history. This is happening in year one of the transition to correct long-standing inequities in the old methodology that we can no longer ignore. We're ending a cycle of low to moderate income policyholders unjustly subsidizing premiums for policyholders with high incomes. Our approach aligns with the Biden administration's call to uh, call to action to deliver equitable programs for all. October 1st also initiated the sale of new policies. Since that time, the new risk rating 2.0 rating engine has processed millions of insurance transactions, resulting in thousands of new policies and hundreds of renewals for policyholders seeing decreases. I'll dive deeper into the new methodology and phased approach to implementation as I walk you uh, through today's presentation. At the conclusion, Andy Neal, um, the NFIP chief actuary will join me to provide uh, specific examples of what risk rating 2.0 means to multifamily property owners. And then we'll take a few questions. Let me begin with some foundational context about the new approach. With increased technological and mapping capabilities, risk rating 2.0 equity in action is communicating a single property's unique flood risk and equipping uh, property owners with the information they need to make better informed decisions about mitigation actions. Under the old pricing scheme, all policyholders were seeing average annual increases of $8 per month for the past number of years. 70% saw maximum 18% increases. And both would have continued year after year if we just left things the way they were. Now with the new methodology, some policyholder premiums will decrease. There will also be comparable premium increases for other policyholders. We're certainly mindful about the concerns over increases and we are upholding statutory requirements currently in place that limit annual premium increases so that rates do not climb by more than 18% per year. And unlike the, old, unlike the old system, the increases stop when the property reaches full risk rate. As I mentioned, we've taken a phased approach to the implementation of the new pricing plan uh, unfolding now and continuing into the next year. Phase one underway kicked off with existing NFIP policyholders being able to take advantage of decreases on the policy renewal date. We also began selling new policies on October 1. Under risk rating 2.0, new policyholders for any structure type located across uh, flood zones will pay the full risk rate. These, those premiums will no longer be subsidized or discounted under the NFIP. I'm sure many of you have been wondering what the reaction has been uh, so far under phase one of the rollout. Since uh, October 1, we've seen a steady uptick in new policies. Approximately 850 current NFIP policies holders have renewed their coverage under risk rating 2.0 of these, 350 are currently in force. 
the remaining contracts are committed to these new rates, but are awaiting their previous policy terms to end. These contracts should enter, uh, they'll go into play uh, within the next 90 days. Under the new pricing methodology, more than 7,700 uh, or 83 percent have seen a price drop uh, relative to their prior NFIP insurance contract with an average savings of greater than $1,300 per year. Never happened before in the history of NFIP. That's over $100 per month that our existing policyholders can use toward their mortgage payment, uh, other insurance costs, or to pay for many other basic needs. For those that are seeing a price increase, the average increase in cost has been approximately $120 per year, or $10 a month, which is on par with increases already occurring under the old methodology. In addition, and pretty exciting news, the NFIP has sold more than 15,000 new contracts and policies since risk rating 2.0 went into effect. Under both situations, I can confidently say the prices are fair and reflect a property's unique flood risk. Before moving on to phase two, let me say we're also confident that the trend towards an increase in new policies will continue because of the wide ranging improvements to the methodology and other improvements that we're making to the NFIP, such as developing a less complex policy form. We believe that risk rating 2.0 will help us close the insurance gap. We're expecting to have more insured properties, not fewer insured properties as the years go by. Phase two of the rollout begin, uh, will begin this coming April. At uh, that time, all remaining policies will be written under the new pricing plan at the time of renewal. While the vast majority will see increases very similar to past years, this was a strategic decision made to allow these policyholders extra time to prepare. As the name implies, uh, risk rating 2.0 equity in action is rooted in fairness as it addresses an inequity in the program that has inadvertently developed over time and is being corrected. The new pricing plan has enabled FEMA to set rates that are fair for all policyholders from Miami to Seattle and ensures rate increases and decreases are both equitable. Once we learned that two thirds of older pre-firm homes have some of the highest rates in the NFIP today, we could not ignore the, inequ the, the inequity. To really appreciate uh, what uh, equity in action means and how it's an improvement over the outdated rating methodology, it's useful to consider where we're headed in comparison with where we are. Since the 1970s, rates were largely based on rather static measurements, emphasizing a property's elevation uh, within a zone on a flood insurance rate map. The old approach did not incorporate as many flooding variables as the new methodology. Those days are behind us. Therefore, risk rating 2.0 is not just a minor improvement, but a transformational leap forward. FEMA now has the capability and tools to address rating disparities by incorporating more flood risk variables like multiple flood frequencies, not just the 1% annual chance event, multiple flood types from river overflow, storm surge, coastal erosion, heavy rainfall, and distance to a water source, along with property characteristics such as uh, elevation and the cost to rebuild. As the new plan now takes into consideration the cost to rebuild, FEMA is equitably pricing premiums across all policyholders based on the unique flood risk characteristics of their property. This has been an industry standard for years that the NFIP is now adopting. Risk rating 2.0 builds on years of investment in flood hazard information by incorporating private sector data sets, catastrophe models, and evolving actuarial science. 
This includes using existing FEMA mapping data and NFIP policy and claims data, along with other federal government data from USGS, NOAA, and the uh, US Army Corps of Engineers. In addition, third party, commercially available, structural and replacement cost data, along with CAP flood models are included. The new approach is clearly a significant improvement. It allows us to set actuarially sound rates and communicate flood risk more comprehensively than ever before. Again, risk is exactly what flood insurance pricing should be based on. Equity in action is transformational, but it is not changing every aspect of the NFIP. As I mentioned, we are upholding statutory requirements by limiting annual premium increases to 18%. This is not changing with risk rating 2.0. Also the use of flood insurance rate maps for mandatory purchase and flood management remain unchanged. Premium discounts for pre-firm subsidized and newly mapped properties continue. Policyholders are still I will still be able to transfer their uh, rate discount to a new owner by assigning their flood insurance policy when property ownership changes. Discounts from 5% to 45% for policyholders in communities who participate in the community rating system, CRS, those continue. However, since risk rating 2.0 does not use flood zones, to determine flood risk, the discount is being uniformly applied to all policies throughout the participating community, regardless of whether the structure is inside or outside of the special uh, flood hazard area, leading to more policyholders receiving the discounted price. Now I'd like to spend uh, some time walking you through how the old uh, rating system compares to risk rating 2.0. Under risk rating 2.0, 23% of policyholders will see monthly decreases, whereas under the legacy system, that simply doesn't happen. Rates only go up year after year. This should not be overlooked because it speaks to one of the tenets of equity in action, which is to reflect a property's unique flood risk accurately and fairly, and to price it accordingly. Before I move on to the next two uh, categories of policyholders in the blue buckets, uh, you'll recall that I shared uh, under the old pricing scheme, all policyholders have been seeing an average annual increase of $8 per month. Under the new pricing methodology, 66%, two thirds of policyholders will see a zero to $10 per month increase in their premiums. Overall, the impact on these policyholders is relatively neutral in year one. Another 7% of our existing policyholders will see on average a $10 to $20 a month increase, which is somewhat more than what they're paying now. Finally, 4% of the NFIP policyholders will see a $20 or more increase in their monthly premiums. These policies simply cover high value homes in high risk areas. Currently lower value homes subsidize these properties and in many cases are paying way more than their fair share. So let me be clear, under both the old rating system and risk rating 2.0, 4% of policyholders see premium increases of more than $20 per month. So let's look, uh, let's take a closer look at the uh, comparison by uh, zooming in on the 4%. So we can see the number of policies increasing by more than $100 per month. Under the old rating uh, system, 45,035 single family policyholders have been seeing premium increases of more than $100 per month. The single family homeowners in this group have an average replacement cost of $399,643. Under risk rating 2.0, only 3,246 
over 40,000 fewer single family policyholders will see premium increases of more than $100 per month. However, the single family homeowners in this group have an average RCV of $1,064,537. The numbers speak for themselves. And please recall without risk rating 2.0, all premiums would continue to increase for all policyholders year after year after year. For many policyholders, that would be way beyond the full risk rate of their property. Instead, the new pricing methodology stops the trend of continually increasing premiums. As you can imagine, designing a new rating methodology took an enormous number of resources of time, people, and technology. It certainly didn't happen overnight or on the back of a napkin. We relied on state-of-the-art technology and the best available data to create a modern-day rating system that builds and expands upon years of scientific developments, actuarial data, and environmental analysis. A multi-model approach was adopted to determine flood risk using a suite of models, much the same way NOAA uses several models to determine potential hurricane tracks and magnitudes. First, the NFIP licensed three sets of commercial catastrophe models, AIR Worldwide, Cat Risk, and CoreLogic. In addition to the commercial flood models, FEMA developed two additional models based on government data and models. Equity in action is designed to adapt to climate change by using the full range of flood risk across a suite of catastrophe models. Because rates are based on the expected claims during the one-year policy period, they must reflect today's risk. Actuarial rates do not pre-fund for changes in risk beyond the policy period. However, future rates will be updated to reflect any changes in that risk because of climate change. Thus, Risk Rating 2.0 already considers the possibility of events like Hurricane Ida. Those occurrences, don't, they don't surprise us, and it doesn't cause uh, a shock to the rates. So let's move to, uh, let's move to some of the endorsements. Some of the stakeholders have weighed in on the impact that risk rating 2.0 will have to communities and policyholders. The National Association of Realtors representing uh, 1.4 million agents has backed the new pricing methodology and acknowledged that risk rating 2.0 will help ensure that NFIP policyholders pay a rate proportionate to their property risk. The Pew Charitable Trust fully supports our update saying risk rating 2.0 will create a fair and more transparent program and encourage more mitigation. We're seeing support from other experts in the press. For example, in, the, uh, in an opinion piece in The Hill, Carolyn Kuski, the executive director at Wharton's Risk Management and Decision Process Center stated that risk rating 2.0 is a critical step in preparing the NFIP for the realities of climate change. And the Wall Street Journal editorial board wrote, risk rating 2.0 is a necessary move towards fairness and fiscal sustainability. This sampling of support reinforces our belief that risk rating 2.0 equity in action is a necessary change required to sustain the NFIP for current and potential policyholders now and for decades to come. You may have seen recently 16 organizations who actively monitor, advise, and yes, who have criticized the NFIP from time to time from across the broad spectrum of interested parties sent a joint letter to Congress strongly endorsing risk rating 2.0 and opposing any efforts to delay the modernized rate setting system. Please take a close look at this, uh, this list. It's uh, very revealing. And even though there are many issues where these organizations have uh, fundamental policy disagreements, they joined to highlight that the new pricing methodology will result in 1.2 million NFIP policyholders that are eligible for a decrease in insurance premiums, 
of policyholders will see a decrease in payments or an increase of less than $10 a month. And that risk rating 2.0 will provide property owners information on their full risk rates, which is critical in encouraging mitigation actions to reduce flood risk. This sampling of support uh, reinforces that equity in action is a needed component of the transformation required to sustain the NFIP for decades to come. Let's turn our attention to affordability. Affordability, which is an issue currently and will continue to be a concern with the implementation of new pricing. In other words, risk rating 2.0 doesn't create an affordability challenge. It's existed for years. In fact, it was an issue when the program began uh, back in 1968 when flood insurance wasn't readily available. And when it was, it was costly. So the original act directed that rates be reasonable. FY22 president's budget includes a legislative proposal that would establish a targeted means tested assistance program for one to four family primary residences, which the NFIP has included in our multi-year reauthorization recommendations. If passed by Congress, this targeted assistance program would serve to offer low and moderate income current and prospective NFIP policyholders a graduated risk premium discount benefit. But importantly, FEMA would implement the program such that eligible policyholders would see, uh, they would see both the full risk price and the means tested assistance they receive. So they would understand their full flood risk, which is imperative to building a resilient nation against the perils of flooding. I look forward to uh, collaborating with the administration's team and with Congress on ways to reduce barriers to purchasing flood insurance and pursuing mitigation options to achieve resiliency. We encourage uh, anyone with questions to visit our Equity in Action website. It's been up for months now at uh, FEMA.gov NFIP transformation for a whole lot of information. Many resources to explore, uh, as you can see here on, on the screen. Um, certainly encourage you to spend some time uh, learning more after uh, our engagement uh, today. In closing, let me say uh, risk rating 2.0 equity in action is delivering a more equitable, and risk-informed NFIP. FEMA believes insurance coupled with mitigation is the first line of defense against the destructive impacts of flooding. By providing a clear picture of a single property's flood risk, we are equipping our existing and potential customers with essential information to make more informed decisions about how to protect the life they've built and reduce disaster suffering. So let me conclude by just simply saying thank you uh, for your time today. And I will uh, over to Andy Neal, who will uh, share some examples that we think will also be helpful for you. Andy? You might be on mute, Andy. There we go. How's that? Can you hear me now? Perfect. I was double muted. I had both my microphone muted and my computer muted. So um, I'm going to dive into some of the numbers that David presented in his presentation. Um, he shared with you two bars, two horizontal bars. One that was the um, <clears throat> the uh, risk rating 2.0 changes that showed the number of decreases the number of moderate increases and some of the higher increases. And then um, <clears throat> he had a bar underneath it was the current legacy rating system. Um, this is showing you that same information, but with a little bit of detail so that we can dive into some of the effects um, of specific categories. And particularly um, I've isolated here 
the non-single family um, breakout in addition to the single family breakout. So whereas the bars in David's presentation had a single green bar, uh, a light blue bar, a dark blue bar, and a gray bar, you can see that these are now broken out into $10 per month increments of what changes people will see in the first year of risk rating 2.0, as well as showing the same changes that we see under the legacy rating system or the old rating system. Um, and these are actually those changes that are currently underway as of April 1st, 2021. What are the changes that people are, um, are seeing in their renewals as they come to renew prior to uh, the availability of, of risk rating 2.0 equity and actions rates? Um, I also have broken out for you here the count distribution of uh, the various types of non-single family homes. So our data is categorized into single family homes. And then we put all non-single family homes on the other side. And I realized that out of all these categories, there's a few of these that you might say, well, I don't know if I care about those so much, but um, this, this distribution, particularly this policies portion here, um, I wanna highlight that of the 5 million policyholders that exist in the NFIP, uh, we have, um, <clears throat> out of the 5 million policyholders, a million of them are condominiums. Um, 1.6 million are all of the non-single family homes. Um, 1 million condominiums, uh, just over 100,000 condominium unit owners. So these are where an association is buying a blanket policy for um, for per building for the policies in a particular building. This one is where individual unit owners are buying individual coverage for their units. And then we have some two to four families of 100,000 uh, other residential, which is everything in excess of two to four families. It's also not a condominium. It's 78,000, 248,000 non-residential policies that spans everything from businesses to other non-residential buildings that perhaps are associated with residential complexes or other residential buildings. And then we've got um, some mobile mon manufactured homes, which probably that's the category you'd say, well, why did you include those? And um, it's the way our data is organized that we put all these together into one group to make these um, exhibits. So when we look at this, David mentioned that 23% of policies were seeing decreases with over 200,000 seeing decreases of more than $100 a month. Um, that's twelve hundred dollars a year, and some of those were actually already seeing uh, reap the benefits of their lower premium. Um, the vast majority of policyholders fall in this category. So, sixty-six percent of policyholders are in the zero to ten, as David said, and then four percent are increasing more than twenty dollars a month, um, which is similar to what we had for all of our policyholders under the old plan, but. Um, Forgive me for being a little bit mathematical here, but the distribution of policyholders within the range of more than $20 a month is drastically different between the um, new risk rating 2.0 plan and the old rating plan, where you can see that it's heavily weighted here at the very tail, the highest portion of the increases. When we look at non-single family homes, um, I would say one way to train your mind in this is that um, many of these are going to be condominiums. So the vast majority of these are going to be condominium um, in one of the in one of the two condominium groups uh, that are here. And as as we see that, we get something similar, except 32% of non-single family homes are seeing decreases in general. Um, of course, none under the current plan. When I move to um, to the zero to 10 category, I've got 55% instead of 66%. But some of that is because you have more decreases happening. So if I, if I sum up the total of the decreases and the zero to 10, I get 88%, which is uh, very similar to what we get overall, which is 89% for the non-single family homes. So similar number of people seeing either very small increases or decreases with a higher number of people actually getting decreases in the non-single family home group. Finally, I've got um, about 1% or just about 100,000 of my non-single family homes going up 10 to $20. And then you can see the distribution of increases 
greater than $20. Um, it is 5.7%, a little bit greater than what we have under the, um, under the entire distribution. But once again, weighted towards the bottom end um, versus having a lot more in the top end that we see under the current rating plan. So when we talk about equity in action, one of the things that we do want to recognize is that um, there are many people who right now are seeing very large increases, and that stops or slows significantly as we move to risk rating 2.0. We have a number of people who are already overpaying, and the way that the current rating plan increases premiums is it does it in very large categories across the board. Um, we actually estimate that our premiums in the NFIB need to increase about 50% compared to the levels of premium surcharges and fees that we charge today. Um, that's different than what you may read in the news media about different modeling organizations saying things need to be up three or fourfold. No, we need to increase about 50%. And that's going to take place over a long time horizon. We expect after about five years, um, we'll have about half of our policies up to full risk rates. After about 10 years, 90% of our policies will be at full risk rates. So in general, we do need to increase premiums, but not for everyone. A third of the non-single family homes are already too high. If we don't implement risk rating 2.0 equity in action, they'll continue to increase instead of decreasing as they should. Um, the classification system of risk rating 2.0, the ability to look at the replacement cost value structures, the ability to not just take a single flood event into account, but to use where you are in the country, where you are in your community, where you are relative to your flooding source, helps us deliver to people whose risk truly is lower, a lower rate. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, we are available to take any questions you may have. Excellent, David, Andy, thank you so much for uh, your insight and your presentations. Uh, I'm certain that uh, everyone who's been attending has found that <clears throat> incredibly helpful. Um, for now, for those uh, who are online, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A function, the chat function, um, to send your questions my way. I know I received a few uh, prior to the uh, call, so I'll kick things off. Um, so in, in terms of, uh, you know, risk rating 2.0's conception, um, for David or for Andy, what were some hurdles to uh, adoption that you were anticipating and, and have those hurdles um, you know, come to fruition yet? Well, <clears throat> great question. Uh, this has obviously been a journey. Um, significant changes like this uh, don't often happen, quite frankly, in the, uh, in the government space. People ask why. Uh, simple answer is it's difficult. Uh, the status quo is is uh, much easier to uh, maintain. So we've been working on this for you know four years, uh, maybe even a little bit before that when the analysis of the uh, current methodology was being uh, was being conducted. And it was that analysis that really spurred the drive, to make this uh, fundamental change in methodology, because that analysis is what uh, uncovered the inequity associated with lower value homes subsidizing higher value homes. And so, when Andy and his team uh, came to that uh, came to that answer, uh, they knew, as uh, actuarial science, that they. Uh, needed to do something about it. And so uh, the ball started rolling. Uh, the ball just didn't roll smoothly down the hill. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, fits and starts, uh, certainly, 
uh, as we uh, continued to evaluate how we were uh, going about developing this new methodology, the decisions that needed to be made along the way. You may recall at one point, uh, we were looking at rolling this out just in eight coastal states. Uh, and so uh, as a, uh, I'll call us a, a learning as a world-class organization, we evaluate along the way and we took uh, appropriate uh, steps to make sure that when we got to the point where uh, this was ready for prime time, so to speak, that it could withstand the public scrutiny that should come from a change of the magnitude of uh, risk rating 2.0. So to, suffice it to say, uh, there have been, uh, we've had some obstacles, uh, but those did not deter us from uh, doing, uh, doing what we uh, unequivocally believe is the right thing to do, not only for those million policyholders, but for the 22,500 communities that depend on this program, because this is one piece of really transforming the program so that it can be sustained uh, moving forward. Uh, Andy, I don't, uh, if, if, if you wanna add uh, a few of the challenges that, that surfaced along the way, I certainly invite you to uh, also provide a response. I'll say one of the biggest challenges for my team is that we started, as David said, recognizing that we had a problem with lower value homes and high value homes, paying the same premium, but then the way that the premiums were set hid the fact that there was a cross subsidy happening, the fact that lower value homes were paying too much and higher value homes were paying too little. Um, and that drove us to start this effort. The next thing we did is is we looked at what is the state of understanding flood modeling today and what are the best actuarial sciences today? And we said, we're, we're going to deploy those as we do this. We're not just gonna apply a Band-Aid to the old system, but we're actually going to, going to update to a more modern, a more up-to-date approach to rating, like what you see in homeowners oftentimes, some of the same techniques and tools they're using for natural catastrophe perils there. When we did that, we went to the policy we have with our homeowners, where we say, anytime there's a condition of flood, we pay, a, we pay a claim if your home is damaged by flood, or if your building, your multifamily home is damaged by flood, we pay a claim. So we needed to understand to the best we could, any, any time that floods can happen, we needed to be able to understand those. And that part, that exploration, is what led to what I talked about, the fact that we now know we need to collect 50% more than we need to collect today. So not only are we differentiating people better according to their risk, but our overall answer is a little bit higher, which does make implementation a challenge. Um, it's not so much higher that it's gonna, um, that it's of a different order of magnitude, but most of our policyholders will be seeing increases. Now they have been for years in many cases. So for many people, it's gonna feel like maybe a slight adjustment or when you don't even notice at all. Um, for those people seeing decreases, it's gonna be significant. And for some of our highest value homes and highest risk areas, that's where they're gonna see a more sustained impact where this might play out for a long time where right now they're paying premiums that are artificially low. They'll come up to premiums that are more like what everybody else is paying, but because they're high value homes and high risk areas, they need to go a little bit further than that. And so uh, that, why, when I say those words, it makes it sound all intellectual. The actual application of that, one by one, one homeowner, one building owner at a time, is gonna come with its challenges. But um, as David said, this is important for us to do for equity reasons and to prepare ourselves for um, the changes that we see happening in the flood risk space due to climate and other changes. Great, thank you, Andy and David, for, for those responses. I think another question that our members have, and, and given that um, they are owners and operators and managers of um, multifamily rental housing properties, is really what is the specific impact to them? The data that's available, 
is uh, either for single family or all other non-single family properties. Um, and Andy, you, you showed us the data um, where you kind of dug into uh, the non-single family properties and what the impact was there. I think a question that a lot of our members have is when you remove condominiums, condominium properties from the equation, um, what does the impact look like for all other multifamily, multi-tenant properties there? Um, so I'll pass that over to you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say it, in general, the distribution is similar to what we see for other properties. And one of the challenges here, so, so you asked about the challenges, I left off actually the biggest one. And that is that when we first were rolling out risk rating 2.0, people asked us, where is this going to be a problem and where is this a good thing? And there is an, a, uh, expectation that there's going to be whole communities where the answer is going up or whole areas where the answer is going up and whole areas where the answer is going down. And what we actually find is that, and you can see this in the data that we posted online, many communities break both ways, whether we're talking about at a county level or then you drill down to zip codes, you still have people breaking both ways. The most important way to understand what this means for you is to go to an agent, get your quote. Now, as David has said, we've actually had been operating since October 1st. I will say there's a couple things I will, I will tell you. Make sure if you already have a policy that you're talking to your agent both about what is my full risk, because that's an important thing for you to know, and you will be shown what your full risk premium is, but also what is my current premium, and so what does my glide path look like? How long am I going to be on a glide path? That's a different answer. And so you will see what your full risk is. In some cases, your members are gonna be part of that group that I, that I said was decreasing and some of them decreasing by a lot. Um, we've had some condominium owners be very surprised at moving from the very, very coarse classification of the existing rating plan to our more fulsome differentiation of risk and value under the new plan and even some very high value buildings can end up with fairly low premium once you take into account the level of risk that they, that they have and the level, level of resiliency that some larger buildings are, are, are made with. Um, and so this is something that really does play out one structure at a time. Um, and so I, if I could give you tendencies, you know, I, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now to break it out exactly what, the way you asked. But if I did, I can guarantee you what you're going to see is there's not an insignificant number that are decreasing. There's a whole lot of people whose increases are going to be fairly typical. And then there's a small number of people that are going to see larger increases. And to just accentuate a couple of points that Andy made, I mean, uh, we believe that it's uh, in, in the realm of risk communication and really understanding the impacts of uh, future conditions and the changes in the climate, uh, et cetera, along with a better understanding of the risk characteristics of, of a specific property now. We believe that understanding, that knowledge, that transparency is important, not only from knowing what your cost is and what your cost may be in the future, but for all of the other benefits associated with knowing what the full risk is. Doing nothing. Sometimes I, I think people want to compare risk rating 2.0 to, quite frankly, something that didn't exist. I think it was maybe the way they wanted things to be. Uh, but quite frankly, that's not the way things are. And so if you want to compare this fact, uh, this factor to the current, under the current, you really had no understanding or knowledge of where your premiums may go. Except for one thing, up. Well, 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 thank you for that explanation, though, Andy and David. Another question uh, I want to pose to the group. Um, for multifamily policyholders, um, it's clear there is the option for taking advantage of a certain flood mitigation incentives. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how uh, multifamily policyholders could take advantage of those or, or, or gain access to those types of incentives? I'll give a real high level and then Andy can uh, dig a little deeper. The biggest change from my perspective is mitigation credits under the old system only applied if you were in the special flood hazard area. 
if you were in the high risk area. Now, regardless of where wherever your multifamily uh, structure is, uh, if you take mitigation actions, you'll you'll receive the benefit associated with reduced premium for taking those actions, regardless of location, high risk, low to medium risk, or otherwise. Andy, you want to build off of that? Yes, sure. Um, so we have a number of ways that we provide uh, incentives throughout the new rating plan. Um, I, I will say that uh, once you've made a building, it's very difficult to do something about your flood risk. I wish it were otherwise. I wish that for flood, we had some equivalent of hurricane shutters that can really, really, really change the answer that you have for, um, for your risk. Most of the changes, once you've already poured in that slab or built your foundation and you've built your walls and roofs and everything like that, at that point, you're, and, and this is not risk rating 2.0 versus old system. This is just reality. There's, it's hard to do something at that point. So let's first acknowledge that together, maybe mourn it a little bit, but also then recognize though that one of the things that David talked about, the credits that are available now everywhere, if you're building in a resilient fashion, if you've elevated your structure, you can get credit for that across the board. If you've built on post piers and piles, if you're in a coastal area, particularly where that style of building is more and more common, um, that you get credit for regardless of the zone you're in. Um, similarly, if you elevate your mechanical and equipment in your structure. So if you've got equipment that's on the ground right now and you can elevate it and you're in a crawl space or an enclosure and you elevate some of your mechanical and equipment up to the next higher floor, you can get a discount regardless. That used to only really be a penalty for people who built non-compliant structures under the old rating plan. The only time mechanical equipment was there is to say, oh boy, not only am I going to charge you a lot, but I'm going to charge you more. We're giving incentive for everybody to be able to elevate their mechanical and equipment. Putting in flood vents, we have um, credit not only in the special flood hazard area, but throughout um, in and out of special flood hazard area to put flood vents in. So there's a number of ways that you can... Um, and that you can retrofit, although I, I, I don't want to make it make retrofits magical because they're not. Um, but they, they do provide incentives through the whole flood, just in and oh. out of what we've traditionally called the flood team. Well, thank you, Andy and, and, and David, for, for that explanation. Uh, another question that we see is um, what type of data um, can we see coming down the pipeline on risk rating 2.0? Uh, in a year, can we see? What actual premium changes have occurred? Um, can we see a greater refinement of premium changes per property type? Um, what kind of data do you think we're, we're going to be expecting to, to see in the future? Go ahead, Andy. So um, we are continually looking at how do we provide data to, to increase the transparency of what's happening in, um, in uh, risk rating 2.0. Uh, we are monitoring the quotes that are happening now, and I will say that um, one thing we see is that the, the distribution of, of quotes coming in is playing out similarly to the distribution changes that we're seeing for those continuing policyholders. Um, so we are seeing a full range of people getting premium um, quotes and seeing both full risk distributions and first year changes play out as we would expect. So um, that's encouraging. Uh, we used a lot of a lot of uh, big data to um, create risk rating 2.0, and a lot of a lot of models. The best of modeling industry has to offer in replacement cost values. One area where we dug in a lot to get um, the industry standard replacement cost value understanding as we were making risk rating 2.0, and as we're now applying it. So. Um, we, we will continue to update data. It, it'll come out in, in waves. Um, uh, so I look forward to no longer talking about the what will be, like what I showed you, and getting to show the, the what is and what won't. Yeah, the only caution I would add to that is, uh, as we all know, uh, data uh, is, uh, can be very useful, and people can also misuse data. Uh, and so it's that, it's that uh, fine balance. And one of the uh, points that I would also add is, you know, our, our book of business is constantly changing. 
unfortunately, we have uh, a retention uh, issue where we'll retain approximately 86% of our policies from year to year. Many years we make up that loss. There's been a few years where we where we haven't. And so the the book is always changing somewhat uh, and not necessarily just a little bit. So um, we definitely are going to continue with one of the foundational uh, commitments we made, and that's to be as transparent as we possibly uh, can be. And we will uh, certainly uh, provide uh, data as it's available uh, because, again, it's a government program and people deserve to understand the program. I wish they would have understood it uh, and had this type of uh, interest in it uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So that's a kind of an unintended benefit associated with a change like this is it's, uh, it's really appropriately highlighted the importance uh, and the value associated with uh, the National Flood Insurance Program. Absolutely, Dave Danny, thank you for that. Uh, I do see uh, a few questions have popped up in our Q&A and before we uh, drop off, I want to just ask one more. Uh, the question is how long can we expect for uh, turnarounds and, and getting quotes? And, and that I think brings in the larger question of what has been the feedback from your uh, insurance agents, the, the insurance agents that are taking part in the program, uh, the insurance agency in general, um, what is the quote process looking like uh, these days? So we've, we've trained over 20,000 agents have taken the training. Um, now, in, this is a space I can talk with at least a little bit of authority as I was an agent for a number of years. Um, sometimes it took me a while to learn things, uh, unfortunately. So even though I took the training, sometimes it took me a while to, to really figure it out. But one of the benefits of what we're doing is we've re really reduced the complexity associated with the program. Uh, the application is gonna be uh, less complex. Being able to uh, get a quote instead of uh, myself or one of the customer service representatives going to you know, a telephone book size manual associated with developing rates for the NFIP, now you'll be able to input eight to 10 pieces of information to the uh, to the FEMA rating engine, the rating engine that we developed uh, for this program. So it'll be a lot simpler. I've been told that it's, uh, it takes half the time. Um, I think it probably cuts it down even more than that, but I'll accept half the time. Anecdotally, there have been similar, uh, uh, similar information shared, uh, shared with me. In addition to the 20,000 agents that we've trained, the write your own insurance companies, our private sector partners, have also trained uh, all of all of their agents. Uh, the vendors, of course, uh, understand it and know it. So it, it should not take very long when you contact your agent to uh, to get a quote. And again, the agents are just so vitally important to uh, the NFIP. Um, and I really look forward to them coming along with understanding the benefits of, of, the, of the program. But if we're gonna close the insurance gap, we need more agents participating in our program. I uh, believe the simplicity that we've, uh, uh, and the, reducing the complexity will encourage more agents to take another look at our program and whether they should include it in their, uh, in their, business, uh, in their business model. I believe they will. Uh, and as a result, we'll uh, help uh, close the insurance gap. We'll also uh, really cut down on the misrated policies uh, associated with the program. Because it was so complex, uh, because uh, you know, a number of other reasons, uh, we, we, we know there were many, many policies in our book of business that were misrated. And so we're gonna be able to really cut down, if not eliminate misrating associated with, uh, with, with the program. So I'm really encouraged uh, about uh, the future. Uh, and as this change becomes uh, more accepted uh, and better understood that uh, the program will only be stronger as a result. Perfect, thank you.
David and, and Andy, thank you as well. I, I want to be cognizant of everyone's time here. So uh, I want to thank you both for your, your candid and thoughtful uh, response to the questions. Uh, with that, I will pass things back over to Kevin. Thanks again. Hey, Sam, thanks. That was, uh, Mr. Morse, that was a perfect place to, to end it on a hopeful note. So um, just a big thanks um, for everyone joining us today. And of course, to our, our partners at FEMA um, for their continued partnership on these issues and their overall work uh, on the NFIP. Um, moving forward, NMHC and NAA will continue to educate and um, advocate uh, on, on issues surrounding risk rating 2.0 and our overall support for the NFIP. We'll, con we'll also continue to push Congress for a long-term reauthorization of the program and for common sense reforms that will enable apartment owners and operators to better mitigate their financial risk posed by catastrophic flooding events. Please be sure to reach out to me or Sam, Sam Gilboard with NAA if you have any questions or want to discuss these issues further. Thank you all and have a great day. Take care.